Welcome to worship at Grand Avenue United Methodist Church. Today we begin the season of Lent, a 40-day period of prayer and preparation as we walk the valley of the shadow of death toward the cross of Calvary and an Easter that is filled with joy. Lent is a season to remember the sufferings of Jesus Christ, a time to remember that to follow Christ is to take up our crosses and be servants of all. A season to remember Jesus' question, are you able to drink of the cup that I drink? It's a season to ask ourselves how we, like Simon the Cyrene, might help bear the cross. It's a season to ask ourselves how we, like Pilate and Caiaphas, and the crowd continue to nail Jesus to the tree. A season to ask ourselves how we, like Peter, are filled with fear and fall away. It's a season to ask ourselves what we, like the woman with fine ointment, have to offer. And finally, a season to watch and wait with Christ, that we may have courage in the time of testing. Most of all, for us, this is a season of prayer. And all during the season of Lent, we are going to be journeying through the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Many of you have committed that to memory, but have you ever paused to pray it one phrase at a time? As we journey week by week, we are going to be considering the lessons that we have to learn and the way that we may apply those lessons in our lives from each phrase. Along the way, many of us are going to be reading a book by my colleague Adam Hamilton called The Lord's Prayer, The Meaning and Power of the Prayer that Jesus Taught. If you'd like to order a copy, there's a link in the comments and description attached to this video. There you'll also find a way that you can request permission to view the videos along with us of Adam's own teaching. However you celebrate, my prayer is that God will bless you as we grow together. As we are worshiping, I invite you to light a candle where you are to remember that you are surrounded by the light of Christ. And bring something of beauty into the place where you worship today, like these flowers that are given to the glory of God and in celebration of their wedding anniversary by Floyd and Carol Dickinson. Happy anniversary, Floyd and Carol. May God bless you as you grow deeper in love with God and with one another with each passing year. As we are worshiping, I hope that you will take a moment to register your attendance using the link in the comments and description attached to this video. There you can also share a prayer concern with us if you would like. And finally, there's a place where you may make a donation either by texting uh, online or through the mail to continue to further the mission and ministry of all that God is doing here at Grand Avenue United Methodist Church. As we are preparing for worship, will you join me in a time of confession? Let us pray. O oh God, we confess that we are reluctant to move into this Lenten journey toward Jerusalem. The past appears pleasant in comparison with the future unknown. We meet pressing human need with fear and pain and inaction. And in a chorus with worshipers everywhere, we say that we have fallen short. We live in a state of brokenness and alienation. We have sinned. O oh God, our sustainer, our redeemer, help us to discover the gifts of power and talent and energy which you have given to us, that we might bring healing into a broken world. Forgive our sin, strengthen our resolve, and renew us in your ever-vibrant spirit. Amen. Friends, now receive this word of pardon. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory be to God. As we enter into a time of worship, I invite you to join with me as we listen to our handbells bringing Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
children of God, welcome. Today we're going to learn about how Jesus teaches us to pray. I don't know about you, but when I talk to someone on the telephone, I sometimes have a hard time of thinking what I want to say. Here's a telephone. Some of you older children of God may recognize it. It's a rotary phone. Some of our younger children of God may not, but nonetheless, it is a telephone that you can make calls on. And some still work today. Most of you younger children may recognize this as a telephone. This is more like what you would see around um, your family members or friends, or you might even have one. Sometimes 
sometimes when I call, they pick up the phone and say, hello. I usually say something like, hi, this is Jordan. How are you doing? They reply, I'm fine. How are you? I answer, I'm fine. But that's when I have a hard time of thinking what to say next. Has that ever happened to you? You know, prayer is a little bit like calling God on the phone. We say, hello, God. And then it's sometimes hard to think of what we should say next. If we are saying a prayer before going to bed, we may say something like, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul will keep. Or if you're saying a prayer before eating, you may say something like, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. You know, Jesus knows that we might sometimes have a hard time knowing how to pray. That's why he gave us an example of how we should pray. It's what we usually call the Lord's Prayer. Do you know the Lord's Prayer? If you know it, you can say it with me. It goes like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That is a wonderful prayer, isn't it? Jesus gave it as an example so that we would know what to say when we talk to our Heavenly Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the example that Jesus gave us so that we know how to pray. Help us to understand that prayer is like talking to you, thanking you for all that you do for us, asking you to lead us in our daily life, and telling you what is on our mind. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. Listen for the word of God. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward, but whenever you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of Holy Scripture.
Of all the questions that I'm asked as a pastor, probably the one that I hear most frequently is, how do I learn how to pray? It's a simple question that is quite challenging to answer. I've had a personal prayer practice for decades now, and yet from the time that my parents first taught me to pray, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, until the time that I started observing the Benedictine Liturgy of the Hours just a couple of years ago. I've been learning something new about prayer every day. About half of the books on the shelf behind me are focused on daily devotion and going deeper and deeper in a personal life of prayer. And of all of the books that I've read on prayer, the prayer that is most common and most commented on is the Lord's Prayer. If you're like many of us, you learned from the time that you were a child to pray this prayer, as my grandmother would say, by heart. Bedtime prayers were an important ritual in the home where I was raised, and I can remember learning this prayer as well as the 23rd Psalm and others from my mom and dad. I likewise have vivid memories of teaching it to Andrew. Prayer time was a vital part of our ritual at bedtime and before school the next day. I wonder how you came to know this prayer. Perhaps you'll share the story of how you learned it in the comments attached to this video. Or maybe, for a few of you, this may be a time when you are learning to pray this prayer for the very first time. And as we journey through each phrase in the coming weeks, I hope that their power and their significance will be even deeper and deeper as you grow in discipleship. As we begin the journey, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. While Jesus clearly prayed many times throughout the Gospels, this is the only place where Jesus says to his disciples, pray like this. And this pattern of prayer has been central to Christian worship and daily devotion from generation to generation for centuries. The prayer appears both here in Matthew chapter 6 and also in Luke chapter 11, where it is slightly different. And then finally, in an early Christian document called the Didache, where it's accompanied by the instructions, pray thus three times a day. I hope that you will pray at least one time every day as we make our way through this holy season of Lent. And as you do, I hope that you'll meditate along the way on each phrase and consider what it means to pray and to live each word. For example, did you ever notice before that the prayer begins with the word our? When we pray our Father, we remember that we were created for communion with God and for community with others in God's name. Rather than my Father, we, the prayer begins with the word our, which is to say that God is not simply the God of Protestants, but also of Catholics and of Orthodox believers. God is not simply the God of conservatives, but also of liberals. God is not the Father of any one nation or ethnic group, but of all peoples everywhere. God is not just the God and Father of Christians, but the Father of Jews and Muslims and perhaps people of other faiths and even people who don't believe that God exists. And yes, in our politically divided times to pray our Father is also to recognize that God is the Father of Republicans and Democrats, of liberals and conservatives. To pray our Father rather than my Father is to recognize our obligation to our neighbors, all of whom are made in God's likeness and in the image of God. We pray our Father. Jesus referred to God in many ways, but the primary way was as Father. There are many names in Scripture for God, but this is the one that Jesus used most often. And praying this way reminds us of God's eminence. We have an intimate, a personal relationship with God. 
with all that is going on in the world around us. I've been praying for the world, for its leaders, and particularly for our president. And as I've prayed, the image that has come to my mind is the one that you see now on your screen. This photo was taken at a time when the world was in almost as much chaos as it is today. With Cuban Missile Crisis looming and voting rights being hotly debated and with race relations filled with struggle and strife, the more things change, the more things stay the same. In those days, I'm sure that many people demanded President Kennedy's time. There were lots of calls to make and appointments to keep. Not everyone could meet with the president, but there were at least two people who could go into the Oval Office unannounced, without invitation. President Kennedy's children, Caroline and John. The picture of young John playing under his father's desk, the most powerful man in all the free world, reminds me that we have a similar privilege. We have the power to come into God's presence through prayer without appointment or invitation. God loves us. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge that for many of us, Father is not a welcoming image. Some of us had amazing fathers, but most of us had average fathers, and some even had fathers who were abusive. I hope that this time of prayer is a, a time when we can experience healing for ourselves and offer forgiveness to others. To pray to God as Father is to remind ourselves, too, of how we ultimately are supposed to pattern our lives with those who come behind us. We are to be to our children the kind of loving and compassionate parents that God is to all of us. We pray, Our Father. And if praying, Our Father, reminds us of God's imminence, the phrase, Who art in heaven, reminds us of God's transcendence. Here I have in mind the, God's own words from Isaiah chapter 55. Here God speaks, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So is my word that comes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. When the weight of the world is on my shoulders and the ways of the world seem oppressive like the circumstances that we currently see in Ukraine and elsewhere, when the troubles of this world seem so much bigger than we are, we need to be reminded that our God is even bigger still. We need, in the words of my friend Carolyn, to stop telling God how big our problems are and start telling our problems how big our God is. And yet, in spite of the vastness of God's presence, Scripture likewise reminds us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. In Scripture, Heaven can refer to the realm above and beyond the cosmos. It can also refer to the atmosphere. The imagery here is of everything between the ground and the dome of the sky. And finally, it's a place where eventually we go to be with God when we die. And when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, we're saying all of this and more. God is above and beyond the whole universe, but is as near as the air we breathe. And God will be with us even when we die. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, our Father, who art in heaven, we pray. And finally, we continue to pray, hallowed be thy name. That is to say that God's name is holy or sanctified. And the idea here is an idea that's linked to the Benedictine expression, ora et labora, which translated means pray and work. The idea here is that we pray as if everything depends on God, but we work as if everything depends on us. God's name is holy. God is Yahweh, the immutable and unchanging. God is Elohim, the creator, the Lord of lords. God is El Shaddai, the God Almighty. God is El Elyon, the sovereign ruler. God is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. God is Jehovah Shalom, our peace. But from the time that God spoke to Moses out of a burning bush, God has given God's name to us. 
And for us to have the power to speak and to use and to be known by God's name is a very powerful thing indeed. When I was in seminary, it was Christmas time, and I'd spent all of my money on tuition and books. I didn't have anything left to buy Christmas gifts for my family and my friends. And my dad gave me his own credit card so that I could use his name to buy gifts for all of them. Now, to be honest, he gave me a J.C. Penney's card to buy things for my mother and my brother and my sister and all of my friends. And when it came to purchasing a gift for him, he gave me another card, a card from Neiman Marcus. But you get the point. I could go into any store and use my dad's name to do the things that I wanted to do. And I could have used it or I could have abused it. If you don't believe that God puts God's reputation on the line by giving us God's name, just talk to some friends who are not a part of the church. You may be surprised, but I'll bet that some of them will tell you that the reason that they are not a Christian is because they've met hypocritical Christians and don't want to be like that. God's reputation is on the line in our lives. And to pray, our Father, is to strive, in the words of Ephesians 5, to follow God's example in everything that we do because we are God's dear children. We are to live a life that is filled with love for others, following the example of Christ, who loves you and gave himself as a sacrifice to take away your sins. We are, in short, God's children. We represent God's name. So when people see you, do they recognize the family resemblance? First of all, when it comes to living out the Christian life, you'll find that some people, as they live out the Christian life, just kind of blend in with the world around them. And others, who don't blend in with the world, try instead to escape the world. But there's another kind of Christian. They take on the challenge to show the importance of God's name, to live out the importance of God's name in the very real world. Yes, they struggle sometimes because they're not perfect any more than anyone can be perfect. But they're struggling to grow. And my hope is that as we continue to pray just these phrases from the Lord's Prayer, and then as we add to them week to week, my hope and my prayer for you is that we will strive in the coming weeks to hallow God's name in all that we say and all that we do until we meet again. Amen.